don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Jeremiah says, don't let the prophets, the diviners, the dreamers in your midst deceive you. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament. Then you can come to the New Testament. You have people like James saying, my dear brothers and sisters, do not be deceived. James 1, 16 and 17. Don't be misled or fooled. Don't be thrown off course. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? From above, from God. (laughs) Not the world, not humanism, not some political entity. It all, don't be deceived. It comes from God. John says in 1 John 4, make sure that no one deceives you. Actually, chapter 3 and 4. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets and false philosophers are going to come out into the world. They're going to try to win you over. Just be heads up. Paul uh, says it several times. For example, to the Ephesian church, he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Fake news. Spin. Made up stuff. (laughs) Uh, They're empty words. Uh, Ephesians 5, 6. To the Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 33, and in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, he says, do not be deceived. Bad company, what? It corrupts good morals, like who you hang out with and who you believe and what teachers you let get into your head. It it has an impact. He goes on to say, I'm afraid that the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and pure devotion to Christ. The simplicity and pure devotion to Christ. Because you might get so enlightened and so insightful And so woke, you'll have like a special knowledge. No one saw it before. Um, He's like, beware. (laughs) Don't buy into that. Um, These deceivers are everywhere. They're false prophets. Um, They're deceitful workers, he said. Uh, Later he writes in 2 Corinthians that uh, they'll disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. They're going to actually try to have like really spiritual insight for you. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as a what? An angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds, of course. When he writes to the Galatian church, he says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows... He's going to reap that. Like, don't get into cuckoo land. To the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 3, do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you. And Jesus said this too. I mean, I could go through many passages, but I want you to know from the Old Testament to the New, it's repeated, don't be deceived. Get your head in the ball game. Christianity is a thoughtful faith. Like, you have to be a thinker. You're going to have to use your mind. Your mind's not transformed. You're not going to be able to pull it off. Um, Jesus said it this way in the Olivet Discourse. See to it that no one deceives or misleads you, for many will come in my name, and they'll mislead you. Many politicians, many university professors... Many uh, meet the ink. Many woke leaders are going to say, this is in your best interest. This is, we all have to come together. God wants us to be united. Well, yeah, he does, but there's a way he wants to unite us too. So throughout scripture, we have these warnings. Don't be deceived. And today I want to make sure that you know that I'm duly warned. Our church is duly warned. And the church in general should be duly warned because a lot of this craziness is creeping into the church. We have progressive Christianity now. I don't need anything progressive. I can tell you that right now. That's a great word. Tarianism and the L. 
LGBTQ, I hope I got my letters right, uh, friendly fellowships, we've got the woke church, the emergent church, you name, there's a lot of new ways to say we are like the cool church. And they will be cool for a year or two, and then there'll be nothing. Because once you get rid of the anchor, you drift. Once you get rid of timeless truth and go with the, the feng shui teaching of the day, well, enjoy your fad because it will be over soon, right? Be over soon. J.C. Ryle, he wrote back in the late 1800s, so over 120 years ago, wrote this. The man who is content to sit ignorantly by his own fireside, his own private thoughts, and has no public eye for what is going on in the church and in the world is one, a miserable patriot, and two, a very poor style Christian. Next to our Bibles and our own hearts, our Lord would have us to study our own times. It's basically saying, again, what we're trying to bridge, word and world. They go together. And what good is it to be an ostrich diving in with your head buried in God's word, but no application around you. It's like having a Bible study while Rome burns. It's like, but it's burning. Ignore the, ignore the flames. Uh, we're just going to do a prayer meeting with Neville Chamberson, Chamberlain. We're just going to, peace in our time. We're just going to pray for Hitler to be good. Well, you can pray all you want. But he's going to take Poland the next week. And then Czechoslovakia, and then Austria, and then... So, what are we going to do? Well, we'll see. Today's verse is from Colossians. Paul writes the Colossian Church, one of my favorite books in the scriptures, because he really, he understands how unique and unequaled Jesus is to anyone ever in history. He talks about the preeminence and the supremacy of Christ, um, the fullness and the greatness of Christ. Uh, he, he says that Jesus is peerless and incomparable, unequaled, unparalleled, unrivaled, unmatched, unsurpassed, which he is. So it's just a great book where Paul goes, Jesus is the guy. All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That's all in Colossians, right? And here in chapter 2, we're going to take a few verses here, starting in verse 6. He says this, Then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and then just overflowing, cascading with thankfulness. But see to it, here's his warning, that no one takes you captive, no one kidnaps you through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends, of course, on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Stay rooted, be strengthened, grow in your faith, like, ugh, keep growing. But make sure that no one takes you captive or kidnaps you with some hollow philosophy that has to do with human tradition, humanism. Or worldly philosophy. The principles of this world, worldliness. After I came to Christ at the age of 17, I took off for UCLA. And uh, when I was at UCLA, which is a very cool, woke university, by the way, <laughs> but not known as like the Christian bastion of the world, but uh, I, had, I got my first chance to take some really good philosophy courses. And I was a new believer, but a few things. I was just shocked at what people were thinking, what some of these philosophers were writing about. Um, and then, of course, since then, I've had the opportunity, like many of you, to study a lot of philosophy and be exposed to a lot of stuff. And I'm like, some of this stuff is just so crazy. Of course, everyone has to deal with, everyone's a philosopher, right? Everyone has a worldview, because everyone has to figure out, who am I? 
and why am I here? And how did I get here? And who made all this stuff? You know, everyone has to grapple with the questions of life. So picture trying to grapple with that with no God. See, that's where UCLA starts. There's no God. We can't go there. <laughs> Even though our school motto is let there be light. We're going to stay in the darkness and <laughs> we're going... <laughs> We're going to try to philosophize, you know, how the world got here. I mean, that's a tall task. You have to come up with some crazy stuff. Let's go with a Darwinian theory. Paul, then this, and then a little fish, and then a little... I'm like, whatever. Monkey? Really? I was a monkey? Uh, but what do you got? I mean, good job, Darwin. I mean, as close as you're going to get if you have nothing. At least you're, you're trying to link something together. Um, philosophy is comes from two Greek words. Uh, Philio, which means what? Philio, love. And uh, Sophia, which means wisdom. So philosophy, philosophia, is the love of wisdom. So they're trying to be wise. Of course, scripture says they're actually fools, but it's always intriguing to figure out how you're going to come up with ultimate truth without an ultimate God. I mean, it really is a challenge, so I tip my hat to some of their cleverness. Um, but the reality is ultimate truth is not discoverable by empiricism or rationalism. Um, it's just bigger than that. Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 9, uh, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, that's empiricism, and which has never entered the heart of man, rationalism, all that God has prepared for those who love him. He says, no mind can even conceive, no eye has seen, no ear has even heard the things that God's going to come up with. You, you couldn't figure this out with your own philosophy. This is like God's going to totally shock and surprise you. It's awesome. But without God, life is despairing. I mean, you read these philosophers. A lot of them took their lives. Uh, David Hume wrote, we're in forlorn solitude. I mean, okay, that's... Wow, he's so disappointed. Um, Nietzsche said, God is what? Yeah, well, now Nietzsche's dead. And God's still well alive. Uh, John Paul Sartre. I mean, did any of you study Sartre? Did you have to do that? Oh, well, let me, <laughs> let me enrich you what you've missed. Uh, he writes, we are a heap of existence uncomfortable, embarrassed at ourselves, confused, superfluous. I dreamed vaguely of killing myself to wipe out at least one of these superfluous existences, but even my death would have been superfluous. Thank you, sir. That's profound. <laughs> Francis Schaeffer said that when you take God out, we're driven beneath the line of despair. In like there's left. And this is what Paul says when he wrote the Romans. Remember in Romans 1, he said they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts became darkened, and professing to be wise, they became fools. Because once you eliminate God and you don't have something that's transcendent, something that's anchored, that's timeless, wow, it just goes super bad. So we're <laughs> we've been plunged into really darkness and hopeless despair apart from God. But fortunately, we have the Lord. And Paul, when he wrote the Colossians, he addresses philosophy in verses 8 through 15. Um, he addresses legalism. He addresses mysticism. He addresses asceticism. So throughout, if you read the rest of chapter 2, which we won't look at today, but if you go back and just use it in your own quiet time, you'll see he's taking on all these isms of his day. And he subjects them to Christ and says, Christ is preeminent. Now, Christ is the answer. All of these philosophies are, you know, a, a cancer, a corruption, a, a venom. They're, they're a virus. They're the, the COVID of Christianity. Um, these are like infectious, um, deadly philosophies. And in the first century, the Essenes had them, and other era and, and different people, we don't need to go into all of that. But let's unpack these three verses again. Are you back in Colossians 2, verse uh, 6? How are you doing online? You hanging in there? You got your Bible? Let's unpack it, and then um, I'm going to make some application afterwards. 
It says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as So he starts off with the positive, walk with Christ, live with Christ, keep going in your faith with Christ, make him a daily part of your life, put your lifestyle pattern after Christ. Remember the old days they used to have uh, little things that you'd wear and it'd be WW what JD? What would Jesus do? Like try to, what would he do? Okay. Oh, you got to go in the Bible to find that out. There you go. So, yeah, pattern your life after Christ. Verse 7, he says, firmly and deeply rooted and now being built up continually in him, stay strengthened or established by God in your faith as you were taught. And then you'll be like overflowing with gratitude and appreciation. And, and so he really talks here about just being rooted and being grounded in the Word of God, which is why we meet on Sundays. Uh, this is just a great concept where the early church says, let's do this every week. Let's start our week off with God first. Let's start off every week with God's Word. Um, and we are still doing it 2,000 years later. We're trying to be, get rooted in Christ and built up in Christ and strengthened in, in our faith. And that's important because... There's a lot of false prophets out there and there's a lot of crazy thinking out there that we have to think through and discuss. Um, there's savage wolves. Remember Paul said that? We looked at Acts 20 that are going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. <laughs> in fact, they want to take the flock out. So we have to be aware of these evil workers, as Philippians 3.2 says. Peter says we need to be on our guard because there's unprincipled men, 2 Peter 3.1, that are going to come in. They're going to try to win you over with some new woke thought. Um, and if you're not grounded or if you're not rooted as the parables Jesus shared, right? When the, the winds come or the floods come, what happens to the planet gets uprooted. It's like, ah, oh, you weren't like anchored enough. You know, you got ripped out so easily. Um, so, and we're seeing that with a lot of students that are going off to college, but not Natalie. <laughs> Poor, pray for UC Davis is what you need to pray for. <laughs> They are so in trouble. <laughs> we got a dissident, <laughs> a rebel coming, uh, someone who's going to see it as it is. But um, anyways, he says, beware. Look at verse 8. See to it, blepo, it's the present tense. It means see, beware, watch that no one takes you captive. Uh, this this uh, sulogo geo is kind of, it really kind of means kidnapped. Um, it actually means kind of booty. Ago means to carry off. So, you know, when you're in war, see to it that no one carries off uh, the booty or the spoils of war. Um, it's, it's using that kind of, kind of army metaphor, military metaphor. Make sure no one takes your wisdom, your mind, your grounded thinking, and, like, they conquered you, basically, and, and then took all of your... Christianity, all of your, your faith. Be, be sure these spiritual predators like don't take you. So beware of hollow humanism and woke worldliness. Don't be, in other words, immature. He's trying to say, like, be rooted. Like, don't fall prey. And, and how would you be taken kidnapped? Or how would you be captivated? Well, here he goes on to say, through hollow and deceptive philosophia, philosophy. You'd be taken away by some empty, false, deceitful, fraudulent, tricky rhetoric. Well, how is it tricky? Well, diversity sounds cool. We, we want, don't we want diversity? Not how they say it. We want inclusion though, right? Well, yeah, but not how they say it. We want equity, right? That's tricky, because that sounds like something cool, but not as they say it. We want to be progressive and moving forward, right? But not how they say it. It's, it's hollow and deceptive philosophy. You have to read the small print. They are not using terms in the same way that you and I would. It's... Can I just take a small little swipe at some of our politicians? I don't like to get, I don't like to get political, but I, 
there's just they give us so much on a silver platter. It's just so easy. But I was just thinking, this is just my mind this week, is like the state and national leaders use a lot of legislation that sounds super deceptive to me. Right? They're highway bills, but so oh, we're gonna get better highways? No. No, it's for the prison system. Why is it called, you know, it's called the Patriot Act. Oh, who doesn't want to be a patriot? But it's really, can we spy on you act? And gather information on you act. It's like, well, you didn't, I didn't, wow, I didn't read that into that act. It's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. That's great, but it's not affordable. And you don't care if we get to keep our doctors. So why is it the affordable care? Like, it just, it's the farm bill. Oh, that sounds cool. I'm all for farmers, aren't you? Well, they're for food stamps. It's like, well, why isn't it called the food stamp? Well, you wouldn't vote for it if it's called the food stamp bill. Um, it's the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Okay, but why such high unemployment, stagnant wages? Why, like, what's the reinvestment? Like, what's the, it's the Equity Act. That's the one, the most recent one. Well, who doesn't want to vote for equity? But this is actually to deny female athletes fair competition in sports by allowing anyone who wants to claim to be a woman to be able to... That's the Equity Act? Why don't you call it the Transgender Athlete Act or something that like we know what it's about? So between you and I, if we ever become a politician, if any of you ever run for office and you want to do a bill, call it the Cute Puppy Act. <laughs> I'm just saying, who could vote against it? It just sounds so beautiful. And then just put whatever you want in it. Anyways, I digress. Okay, so <laughs> the point is, Paul is warning the Colossians, beware of hollow and empty philosophy. They're going to look at what the words mean because they may not be what you think is basically what he's saying. And it all depends on what? What does your Bible say? Human tradition. You might as well just say humanism. It's all based on human tradition. That is, what people have been saying for a long time apart from God. It's like Darwinianism in the schools. It's, it's, such a, it's been a tradition now for a good hundred years that it's almost just taken for granted. You know, we're all evolving. You mean growing, maturing? Like, what do you mean we're all evolving? Well, like, everything evolves. You know, everything... Everything changes from a frog into a monkey and like, what? But it, it's hard to, it's so human. And it's so in it now, you can hardly get out of it. Um, I remember reading about Hitler's henchman, Joseph Goebbels. You might be familiar with him. He said, if you tell a big lie uh, long enough and you keep repeating it, people will eventually believe it. <laughs> That's why we haven't changed the scriptures. Aren't you glad they're not updated every year? <laughs> Can you imagine? Did you get this year's supplement? Uh, the Mormons do that. You know, I guess black people can go into heaven now, which is cool. God's changed his mind. You know, they they keep up updating with their newest presidential insight, which is super cool for them. But for us, it's so boring, right? It's the same stuff every year. We don't keep updating. Um, we're just we're just grounded. Um, Jesus was confronted by some of the Pharisees, recorded for us in Mark seven, eight, and nine. And they said to Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why aren't they doing religion the way we Jewish high-minded people think we should do it? And Jesus responds to them, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of men. You nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your man-made traditions. See, there's not something intrinsically wrong with traditions, but Paul is saying, beware. God's word always trumps whatever tradition you think you have. And beware of empty traditions or humanistic traditions or things that have just been said so often that you... God helps those who help themselves. It's like, how much heresy can you hear in a bumper sticker statement like that? It's like, where is that in the scripture? That's interesting. Um, but it's just part of the tradition, you know, and it's been around. 
And he says, not only is it based on this kind of hollow philosophy, but he adds a second thing. The basic or elementary principles of this, what does your translation say? World, right? The basic or elementary principles of this world, which is worldliness or secularism. So just be careful because there's going to be principles that are kind of like ABC kind of infantile teachings that are based on worldliness, but they're not based on God. In fact, that's how he ends in verse 8, rather than on Christ. So Paul's saying, like, walk with God, you know, just keep trucking, you know, trying to follow Jesus, do what, do what Jesus would do, and be rooted and be grounded and be anchored and strengthened in your faith so that you can stand in a crazy world, which we live in. He doesn't want to take us out. He wants us to have an impact here as own light. But be heads up, blepo, see to it that no one takes you captive or like kidnaps you or like drags you off through some hollow or empty philosophy, some humanism, some new woke thinking or just some ways of the world. They're all based on these principles of the world like globalism and communalism or whatever the, the, the cool feng shui thing of the day is. He says, be careful. Don't be deceived. Um, because it's not really, as he's going to go on to say, and we see through scripture, it's not just a philosophy. And as I've did, talked to you, it's not just a political viewpoint. If I thought that, I wouldn't deal with it on Sunday. It's a political worldview. It's just a philosophy. No, these have come into our lane. They're a God substitute. Well, and the state needs to be worshipped. And they have their social justice cult. And they want to ban us, by the way. They're not like, you church people do your thing. We're just going to do our thing. Oh, no. No, it's not like that. No, it involves tyranny and compliance and mandates. They're in our lane. And that's why we're dealing with it. So to give you some practical stuff, having looked at our passage for the day, um, here's what I want to give you uh, today and in some of the weeks ahead. We're going to have to deal with the identity of wokeness. The identity stuff of wokeness. Because when you get into scriptures, there's only how many races? One race, the human race. And so God sees our differences and our diversity based on things like gifts, talents, personality. So we have a worldview where it's like, I love diversity in the workplace. That's awesome. You know, some people are sanguine, some are melancholy, you know, some are, you know, executors, some are strategic thinkers, you know, all kinds of different ways. Some are introverted, some are extroverted. God sees people on these categories. But in the woke identity world, it's based on class, race, and gender. So we're going to have to unpack that a little bit because they're, they're a little bit off on that. Well, they're a lot off. I'm trying to be charitable. Um, I think some of them probably do mean well, but they just got the categories wrong. And once you get those wrong, there's a problem. Once you get the idea of that there's multiple races, it's like, I'm a white guy. You're a black guy. We're not even the same race. How could you understand me? You see, once you get the category wrong, it's like, I don't know. How could Well, you have nothing to say. You're not my color. But once you get the category right, wait a minute, <laughs> we're the same race. We both came from Adam. We both have the same origin, the same God on the same planet. We both are human beings with a heart and a soul and a mind. We have different pigmentation. Well, you're brown-eyed, I'm blue-eyed. What, we want to separate on that? Well, what, we're going to take the blondes and the brunettes and go, pigmentation's really a big deal, people. The, the whole world has to be divided. No, we don't go that route. We're the same race, so we can understand each other. But we have different ethnicities and different diversities and maybe nationalities. I'm Dutch. I mean, who wants to be Dutch? I mean, you know. <laughs> so that's supposed to be beautiful, those diversities. Not divisive. But if you get the category wrong, it's like, you're not even of me. We're not even the same species. And then the whole thing melts down. So we're going to have to look at identity. We'll do that one week. We're going to have to look at woke justice. 
and biblical justice. I mean, what is social justice and what's like God's view of justice? So we'll have a week, at least we're going to have to look at that because one's distributive, one's retributive, one has to do with kind of collective guilt, one has to do with you being responsible for your own <laughs> choices. Um, and I think that'll be super helpful. So we'll look at that. We're going to have to take a Sunday too where we're going to look at some deceptive definitions because in order for you to just be heads up out there, I want you to kind of know what these words are and I'm going to give you a handout, oh, a cheat sheet so you can walk around at work and go, oh, white fragility. Okay, I know what you're talking about now. Cisgender. Oh, gotcha. Um, like, so you kind of can track with the new code words. And today, guess what? Some of you are going to be so happy. You get a handout. Wow. So Paulette, do you want to help me with these on this side? Do you want to help me? Um, Lisa, maybe you can help hand out. If you want to hand out, you don't all have to take one, but some of you are just, I know you're so smart and you're so like, I want to get this stuff. So what I want to do now is instead of deal with the identity, the justice, and the cuckoo definitions, I just want to talk about some life views that if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand how we got where we are. Because wokeism, or the deception of the day, is based on lots of different life views or worldviews colliding and coming together. Okay? So, I hope this is helpful. I just want to make the word become super practical for you. So, I'm going to draw a little bit. Are you okay with that? So, um, I'm going to just put God up here like this. So this is God. Um, this would include heaven, right? There's some pearly gates there. Beautiful. Can't wait to get in. Um, these are, you know, you got the kingdom of love up here and stuff. And, and then you have the world and you have mankind and stuff, right? So you have the world and then we've got um, man. Um, all of these worldviews or life views have to do with what you would have to grapple with once you take God out. Just so you're tracking. So if I were to, in my mind, kind of draw this, I would just draw a box here. Because we're now moving into a closed system, not an open system. So you just have to understand, in the, in the world... Um, you can't write a paper at UCLA and talk about, well, the Bible says, <laughs> that's such an old book. No, no, no. No, you can't include God. We're not going to talk about God at work. No, you have no heaven, by the way. You're not going. When you die, you die. Deal with it, people. Dead Poet Society. Gather ye rosebuds while you made. You know, old time is still flying, but this rose that gathers today, tomorrow will be dying and you're done. It's over. Um, hope? No. Miracles? Sorry, they're all outside the box. So if you're sick, deal with it. Don't pray for a miracle. Go to a doctor. Um, but we say, go to a doctor and pray for a miracle, right? Because he can do things doctors can't do. And he does. But in these worldviews, remember, those are all outside. They're all out here. And because you're not even in our world, don't even see you. La, la, la. La, la, la. Don't want to hear it. Sorry, Dave. Uh, pipe down. This is an NC2A meeting. We're not, uh, it's not church. So we don't want to hear your views on God. Well, but what about religious exemptions? What about people of faith? Shh, 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 shh. You're outside the box. This is crazy land. Okay, stay in, stay in here. So these are the world views. Now, this week, this was a hard week for me because I'm like, how can I reduce all of this into two words? You know, I did my best. I'm not saying it's accurate. Do not, like, go, I looked this up and Dave kind of doesn't get it or something. That's probably true. I, I don't know if I do get it, but I'm trying to get it. So I'm trying to get it with you. So here we go. Are you ready? Secularism is affirming worldliness and it's rejecting trans. It includes anti-supernaturalism, earth centrism and stuff. In other words, once you eliminate all of this, right, it's all about the secular. That's Latin for what? World. World. It's going to have to do with the world. The planet. Wow. 
know God, the planet. So now the climate's very important. God forbid we lose one degree of something because we didn't destroy a number of nations in the process. The planet, ecosystems, Green New Deal, these are all about, because what, Father God? Bye-bye. Mother Earth, love it. That's interesting. Wow, they even changed the gender on the whole worldview. That's really interesting. Anyway, so we're in a secularist worldview, and it's going to be, I'm going to jump to three, humanistic. It's going to be man-centric. We're going to affirm the self and reject others. So man is going to be what Nietzsche calls now a superman, because he's not accountable to anyone. This guy's amazing. Um, it's all about him. And then if we go back to, um, and that includes Darwinism and speciesism, because he's the most of of the naked apes, you know, so he's amazing. Um, and then atheism, number two, is really affirm man and reject God, but it's idol-centric. In other words, God's already made everyone a worshiper. You have to worship something. Something has to give you meaning. So you've taken God out. So you're going to have to erect um, some sort of golden calf or something. Uh, youth sports or something is going to have to become super important to you. So you're going to get fanatical and crazy because you're going to worship this stuff. I mean, if you're unvaxxed, you need to be eliminated, right? Instead of, like, it's not about the vax. It's not about the vax. It's about freedom and choice and dignity and respecting people. But when you're part of this world system, whatever is up here, this is so preeminent. Now, of course, God is gone, so this is automatically in a, I don't want to be cruel here or anything, but it's already kind of a demonic worldview, if I could say that. I can say that in church, right? I wouldn't say that. Don't say that at work. Don't share that with anyone. But it's an, just an anti-God theology or philosophy, which is going to include all kinds of um, worldviews that are not about God. So we've got secularism, atheism, humanism. So now we know it's about the world. Some idol you're going to have to create because there's no God. You have to create something you worship. And it's going to be man-centric. And then there's a bunch of other worldviews that I'm just going to throw quickly at you. Rationalism. We're going to affirm reason. And we're going to reject faith. Let me just put a, I'll put a mortar board on his head. Do you remember what a mortar board is when you graduate? Because he's so smart. He doesn't need... God. He's rational and reasonable. And then we're going to add relativism because we're going to affirm subjective experience and we're going to reject absolute truth. So I'm going to just put some glasses on him because everyone's going to do what's right in their own eyes, right? According to uh, judges. Uh, it, it, truth is what... It's your truth, people. There's no like objective truth. You can walk off that building. If you think you'll fly, you will. I mean, I believe it. If you believe it, I, I, you can do it. Please walk off the building. <laughs> Sorry, that's so cruel. Pray for me. That was just so fallen. Empiricism, we're going to affirm science, and we have to reject spirituality. This includes like materialism, positivism, experientialism, but this is all about, you know, I'm going to put this up in his hand. Science, because, you know, we're just so smart. Pragmatism, we're going to affirm what's practical and reject morals. Hedonism is we're going to affirm the flesh or fleshly desires and reject soulish needs. This has to do with Stoicism, Empiricism, Libertarianism. We're going to deal with these, by the way, because we're going to get to Acts 17 where Paul does his argument at the Areopagus with the philosophers and he's arguing with Epicureans and Stoics. So we're going to have a good Sunday with those two cats. Wow. He just demolishes them. It's so cool. Um, anyways, hedonism has to do with, look, if you feel it, do it. So let's put a, let's put a nice wine bottle here and just a little martini and just a few drugs and stuff. Look, whatever makes you feel good, sedate, look, life's hard. So, so I eat 10 donuts. I mean, I'm a hedonist. Egalitarianism. Affirm sameness, 
reject differences. Feminism, homodynamism, selfism, narcissism, all these kinds of isms kind of flow from this egalitarianism, which is, this is different from, um, like, feminism is, there, there is a really healthy feminism, you know, which is like, women are like people too. I have three daughters and I have three sons. So it's like, yes, they're equal in value, equal in significance equal in worth before God with equal access to lots of different jobs and they, they're capable and they're, but they're not the same. Oh yeah, they are the same. Men can have children. <laughs> no, people are saying that today. Yeah, If I want a child, look, I, I'm the same. Okay. That seems a little forced to me, just saying. It just seems a little... So we have equal value, but we're not the same. Actually, God built in some differences and different sex roles to complement one another. Instead of egalitarian, I'm a complementarian because he doesn't want you to be a god. So he's built in, to me, deficiency. I need Sue outside me. I need femininity outside myself. I need you ladies in the family of faith. And I need brothers in Christ. I, I, like, I'm not self-sufficient. I'm not the Marlboro man. You know, I'm not the self-made man. We, I, could, I think that sometimes, but it's a terrible self. So uh, egalitarianism is a worldview. Progressivism affirms... What's, what's the theme? What's the theme of progressivism? I told you last week, progress, right? The world is a stair step, right? Because everything's getting better and better, and they like new and novel and all that, so anything that's old or antiquated is just so like outdated. You're so left behind. Uh, so that has to do with affirming progress and rejecting tradition. It also includes things like modernism, presentism, technoism. Uh, there's, a, I know, some of these words you're like, technoism? I didn't even know that was a word. Look, if it's in technology, it's cool. There's never a sense of, whoa, well, maybe it's not helpful. Maybe it's deceptive. Maybe it's, e no, no, no. Tech, all technology is good. All modern things are good. Hey, look, the latest studies say. Nine out of ten modern doctors say. Yeah, but what have all the doctors over time said? And what does research show? And like, what is... No, the latest is... Presentism is a sense of, well, that's not the latest research. You mean the latest BS? The latest cuckoo-ness? Like, the latest research, but it may not be. May not be. Uh, collectivism is the affirming of the group, rejecting of the individual. So, you know, the, 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 the people are down here. You didn't build that. You know, you're just part of a collective. You know, you're a nameless person. It's about kind of the group. And the individual is rejected. And you can see how that's going to set up communalism and socialism. And it's going to lead very nicely to, like, Marxism and statism because it affirms communism and rejects Capitalism and it affirms state control and rejects free markets because free markets and capitalism have to do with like individual autonomy and owning your own property and being able to make decisions about your own business. But you can't now. You're mandated to do what the state tells you to do with your business because it's really not your business. And by the way, those aren't your children. They're owned by the state. We let you use them for a while, but if we don't like how you parent your children, they're ours. So we have a lot of isms, I just want you to see some background, like how do we get to this woke stuff, because we're going to deal with race and gender and all the modern things right now, the newest woke things, but you, you couldn't get there unless all of this was there. And then there's globalism, which is affirms centralism and rejects nation states. In other words, we want a European Union, we want to do what the, what is it called, the Health World Health Organization says, not what our best doctors say. We want to do what the world courts say because we want to eliminate nations. Nations are a hedge against the Antichrist. Nations are a hedge against evil because if like 
Hitler goes bad, well, maybe Italy will be fine. Oh, they have Mussolini. Okay, so that well, if they both go bad, then maybe there's a hedge in France. You know, maybe we England, maybe a Churchill can like step in. But if they were all part of the European Union, like today, if Hitler was in charge of the European Union or Mussolini, or they made a Russian a deal with Stalin, the whole European hemisphere would go. And if we happen to be a part of that world order, then we would go too. Now we're into prophecy, and it's not very fun going forward, but we're going to make it, people. Don't get discouraged. We're going to make a difference, and God's got us. So that's globalism. It eliminates nation states, which is a way of un affirming unlimited power, which, which the Antichrist is going to really love, and it's going to reject limits and boundaries. You're already hearing a lot of stuff about, we don't want boundaries. Open borders is, is a globalist view, which is let anyone come in, bring anyone, like we're all one people. We're not one people. Not like that. They're setting up for one antichrist to like do a lot. And we're down to just like four antichrists right now, right? Bill Gates, uh, the head of Facebook, the head of... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they are kind of antichrist because they're anti Christ, and they do have like global impact and can hurt a lot of people and businesses like in one day with one decision. So we're, we're getting there. And then I just added two more for you for the fun of it. Pacifism, which affirms compliance, peace, next confrontation and war. In my opinion, it affirms weakness and cowardice. That's my own personal bias, but pray for me. It rejects strength and courage. Passivism is a very important worldview because it basically says, people, trust your government. Really, they mean what's well. I mean, don't put up a fight. Don't. And I can connect to that because there is a harmonious peace in me. I, there, I, there is a peace building side to me. I want to be a reconciler. So I, I want people to get along. And I love the Olympics, as you know. Like everyone, like they release the doves and all the nation's flags and we're holding hands. And it's like, I'd like to teach the world <laughs> to sing. You know, it's beautiful. But Sean, you know, as a police officer, it doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't work that way. They even bombed the Olympics in 1972 and killed all the Israeli athletes. I mean, like, it doesn't even work at the Olympics. So passivism is a way of saying, you don't need guns. Those are instruments of violence. Don't give them to your boys. Don't even give them a squirt gun. Doesn't every boy want to grow up and be a provider and a protector and be able to protect his family and others against evil? But this says, no, that's bad. Why is it bad? Because how in the world are they going to take away have instruments of confrontation or resistance. You need to be more pliable and compliant. And then existentialism is a worldview that basically affirms despair and rejects hope. It's very pessimistic and skeptic, uh, skeptical and nihilistic. Um, there's a lot of that, but of course woke people don't want to talk about that because they're so hopeful that the world's going to get better. And if it is pessimistic or if it's not going well, who do you blame? All these people that don't get our worldview. These people are the problem. They know the church is the problem. Free thinking individuals, you are the problem. And one Sunday, because you are getting tracked right now. They know where you are. Thanks to carrying your phone, we can ping you. We know where you're going, and your little phone's going to tell you after you leave church today how many miles it is for you to get to your next location because it's been tracking you, so it knows where you go on Sundays after this. Right to the liquor store. <laughs> I, I mean brunch or your home. I don't know where. <laughs> but it's on there. We know. And God forbid you buy anything on that device or a computer or anything that has your name on it because... We now know what you're buying, so be ready for those specific ads to come up that are going to show you, oh, you might like this book too. Well, that's like the one I just bought yesterday. And you might look this like this patio furniture if you're looking. So that's their way of helping us get out of existentialism is give you hope that we know you and we care about you and trust us. 
We'd never use that against you, like they are in China right now, locking up Christians, because they have information on them. So we've got to be heads up. So in closing, here's what Paul says to the Colossians in verse 6 through 8. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as your Lord, continue to live in Him. Continue it, people. Do it. Keep walking it. Stay rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in your faith as you were taught overflowing with thankfulness. So keep getting strong. You're going to need it. But see to it that no one takes you captive or kidnaps you through hollow or deceptive philosophy, which depends on humanism, human tradition, and the basic principles of this world, worldliness, rather than on Christ. Amen?